So have it your way. Flexible choices for building your website. And I've kind of altered the, the content of this presentation to not really be website oriented in the terms of HTML and cascading style sheets and things of that nature. I'm really focused on web applications and web application development. Uh, so this is a presentation for developers specifically around using various web frameworks on top of the JBoss platform and some of the pros and cons associated with those various frame, web frameworks. So I thank you very much for your time today. And uh, we're going to be spending about an hour together. We're going to walk through this presentation. I have several demonstrations to show you as well. A lot of interesting content, I think. And I got several emails after the first session uh, wanting the presentation. So if you want the presentation later on, just send me an email and I'm happy to send it to you. Okay, and your Q questions should go into that Q&A panel. As the moderator just said, our producer just said, it might be a little hidden, a little hard to find. So just be aware of that and put the questions there and I'll get, the, toward, get them towards the end. So a little bit about me. I'm now the product manager associated with these various projects here at JBoss, uh, specifically JBoss Developer Studio, or otherwise known as JBoss Tools. So if it's open source, jboss.org, JBoss Tools, or if it's the product, the enterprise product, JBoss Developer Studio. Uh, but I'm also associated with Seam and Snowdrop, Rich Faces. Uh, those are technologies you might have heard of before. Snowdrop is our spring integration technology for helping to enable spring on our platform. Um, but I'm also associated with a little bit with Archelion which is our integration testing framework. So if you're interested in automated integration testing, Archelion is a wonderful little tool that I think you should uh, definitely research and check out. Uh, there'll be more content around Archelion, and we have some other webinars we've, where we discussed Archelion and demonstrated it out there. All right, we also have Seam Forge that's kind of cooking along right now, a rapid application development framework for building Java EE applications. So it's going through the process of, um, uh, through the open source community process right now, and you can find out more about that out there at jboss.org as well. Um, but I've also been spending time with uh, projects like Steam Cannon, which is a platform as a service technology. You can actually go to steamcannon.org today and launch your JBoss application servers out there at Amazon and then deploy your applications in a simple fashion. So that concept of actually managing JBoss in a cloud architecture, uh, Steam Cannon is our jboss.org project representing that technology right now. So I'd encourage you to go out and try that as well. Torquebox is a Ru Ruby on Rails implementation on top of JBoss. So if you're interested in Ruby on Rails and you want enterprise class features like clustering, caching, uh, scalability features, as well as um, technologies like messaging as an example, Torquebox would be the place you want to look. So if you're interested in Ruby on Rails or you, you know Ruby on Rails people, see if you can get them to download Torquebox and check it out. It looks and feels like a proper Ruby on Rails development and production environment. So that's just a little bit of what I've been working on. And I spend a lot of time focusing on cloud-related deliverables, cloud-related technology, as well as web frameworks and how people want to build web applications and deploy them to the various environments. So this is just my little cute what's going on from a developer standpoint. You've seen it in many of my presentations in the past. Uh, I continue to use it because I think it's relevant, and all I do is I change all the content within it. Uh, in this case, you know, COBOL was what we did back in the 70s and 80s, and COBOL was from one vendor. It was one solution. There was not, you know, you, you didn't have to go to five different places to figure out how to use the COBOL. You went to one training class from one vendor with, with your one server, and everybody kind of knew exactly how to do things. So being a developer back then, I would say, was relatively easy. I'm not suggesting it was completely painless, but relatively easy in that you didn't have to know a number of technologies from a number of places. And then throughout the 80s, we started adopting some distributed computing technology in the form of C, C++, maybe CORBA. We may have adopted four GLs. For some of you out there, you may have had the uh, pain and suffering associated with CASE, computer-aided software engineering. Uh, I did that as well. Uh, relational database technology kind of started coming to the forefront in the late 80s. And Unix, of course, blew up onto the scene in the 80s. And you had to learn maybe some Solaris or SunOS, and you had to learn AIX, and you had to learn HPUX, and you had to learn everybody's Unix. And then in the 90s, we had the chance to um, uh, really dig into this web concept. So you might have done Power Builder or Visual Basic back in the 90s, maybe SQL Windows, if you remember that technology. I got a chance to play with several of those technologies. But the web really took hold in the late 90s. And so HTML um, uh, and, and uh, CGI, which is Common Gateway Interface, so that's how do you plug into the back of an Apache server, or maybe it was NCSA or whatever server you might have used. You had to learn what a GET was, what a URL was, what a POST would do, what form fields were what a cookie would do, and of course, back in the days, in the 90s, you had to convince people that a cookie would not steal their credit card. I spent a lot of time talk, having those conversations with people that it was okay. Uh, you might have learned Java back then as well, servlet technology, EJB technology. Um, but as you can see, as a developer, you're having to gain more and more skills from more and more vendors, and just the list keeps going and going and going. 
which is fun. So if you've been around for the last decade, you learned model view controller, special design patterns and best practices like model view controller, dependency injection, object relational mapping, strut spring, hibernate. You probably learned about XML and web services, maybe even Java server faces. Certainly everybody got all about rich internet applications and Ajax back, you know, the last several years and maybe even changed your methodology from a waterfall model to an agile model and automated testing like JUnit, TestNG. So you can see the list just keeps on coming. And as a developer, your skill set keeps on growing. Nowadays, we want you to learn GWT. You got to be conscious of the mobile platform. You got to be thinking about how you build applications for an iPhone or an iPad or an Android phone or an Android tablet. You have to be thinking about tools like jQuery or ext.js maybe. Uh, certainly, you might have explored Grails and Groovy or Rails and Ruby. Uh, Scala with Lyft. I should have put Lyft on there. I forgot to. Uh, you might be exploring that. Open social technology is something else people are digging into these days. Widgets or gadgets. Um, Google Gadgets is an example. Seems to be happening right now, too. Uh, plus, we're trying to change the way we build things, like Maven instead of Ant, as a way to build our applications, and um, Git instead of SVN, instead of Subversion. So we migrated from uh, you know, CVS to <laughs> S Subversion, and then now we want to migrate over to Git. So the list keeps on growing, and I've just put that out there because today we're talking about some of these things over here on this right-hand column. We're going to talk a little bit about Google Web Toolkit, and we're going to talk a little bit about what's happening at EE6, EE5, you know, what might, you might be doing around these various web frameworks as an example. And of course, your ultimate goal, if you learn all these things and you master them all, you're, you're the superhero. So the UI tier, all right? The UI tier is the where we're focused, the, the layer, uh, the UI layer. And it's a particularly exciting area for me in particular. Uh, I think it innovates faster than any other area of application development. There are dozens of players, whether they be individuals or small teams of open source projects or major vendors, always trying to outdo each other, always vying for our attention as developers. They might be, and we're constantly distracted by all these technologies. When do, when do I use GWT, Google Web Toolkit? When might I use Flex or jQuery or, you know, isn't Strut still king? You know, you have to answer those kind of questions all the time. And so this presentation attempts to uh, address some of those particular questions and needs. Uh, so it's a very dynamic and exciting area. I consider it to be some of the more challenging programming uh, for getting a cross-browser based application to work really well and making a really nice engaging user interface for your end users. It's a tough place to be. Now this is not for the area, this is not for developers who say, hey, I'm a, I'm a back-end developer. I don't do any of that stuff people see. Well, the stuff people see is really where the action is, I think, and where you're going to make the most money as a software person because you're what's selling the application. So it's a matter of taste when it comes to picking these various tools. So I'll tell you that up front. I'm going to talk to you a lot about different tools and a lot of different frameworks and things of that nature, but it's really a matter of taste. Which one do you, which one do you want to work with more than anything else? So this little... Um, this little diagram here basically talks a little bit about the history. Uh, 2002, we were all about struts. Uh, I did a presentation in the Atlanta market back in 2002 for, on struts, and struts really started bloom, uh, blooming in that time frame. And we learned about model view controller and how to, how to build applications differently. And then around 2006 or so, we started talking about Spring and Hibernate more, getting those involved inside of our application development architecture, our web stack. By 2010, last year, we were dealing with people who were doing JSF and Rich Faces with Seam or Spring MVC, uh, Google Web Toolkit even has gotten to be very popular. And then, um, and now going forward, we're seeing JSF2 and Rich Faces, a lot of people demanding that from us and very interested in it. Spring MVC continues to be a player, GWT continues to be a player. And then going forward though, beyond this, well, we are looking at a, a solution that's yet to be identified. I call it a RESTful UI engine. And we'll talk more about that in a second, but the idea there, that's where I have a JavaScript client interacting with my server-side services, all RESTful services. And so there's some new things impacting the, the horizon, specifically around mobile and cloud. So the drive towards more mobile uh, technology out there than ever before, IDC predicts that mobile smartphones or smartphones in general and tablets will outship desktops this year in 2011. We're going to get more and more demand as developers to be able to support those more exotic devices and exotic browsers in, in unique ways when it comes to our application development skills and our frameworks and tools that we use. So today's discussion is just going to cover these frameworks and, and, and we're actually going to kind of go through the first couple very quickly. But you know, we, we talk about serverless and JSPs, we'll do a little struts and Spring and Hibernate, uh, we'll talk a little bit about Spring and BC and have some demonstrations of that. We'll talk a little bit about JSF1 and Scene 2 and Rich Faces 3, have some demonstrations of that as well. A little bit about Google Web Toolkit or GWT, 
I have some small demonstrations in that area. And then we're going to talk a little bit about jQuery or EXTJS on a Spring MVC or REST Easy backend, that particular architecture. So these are just different architectures, different ways to build out your web applications by combining these different technologies. This is not all inclusive, obviously. There's tons more frameworks than this out there, and you can combine them in different ways. Like I might want to use Spring with my GUID application, as an example, uh, or I might want to use C with my GUID application. Um, I'm just throwing these out there as kind of major defining points that you will make a decision around. And then uh, Adobe Flex is another one. Uh, no demonstration of that one here in today's presentation, but we'll talk about it. And then Java E6, we'll, we'll focus on that a little bit as well. Okay. I threw this slide in after some thought. Uh, Matt Rabel is, uh, of at Fuse frame, uh, fame, he's actually done a ton of work in researching these, these various frameworks, and he does a really great job keeping up with them year over year over year. And he just recently did a couple presentations at DevOx in Belgium and Rich Web Experience, both in 2010, I think November and December were the time frame. So this is fairly current information. And he kind of did his own roundup and looked at all the different web frameworks that are out there and kind of picked the top four to five. And if you notice, the top four are pretty consistent. Grails, Gwit, Rails, Spring MVC. And that fifth one is a little bit random, right? It might be a Wicked or Struts. It might be a, a Vodner Tapestry. Um, and, of course, the dark horse on this list, the thing to watch out for is Play. The Play framework is gaining popularity and growing uh, pretty rapidly now. So, And I'm very interested in it as well. So I keep all these things on my radar. And we really focus on making sure these things run well with JBoss. We want to make sure that our users can pick the tools they wish to use so they're most productive, that solves their business problem, and runs great on their JBoss solution, JBoss platform. Uh, so some of those others that are not really part of my presentation today, um, don't want to spend a lot of time on these. Uh, but the, the ones I'm most interested in personally are Grails with Groovy, Rails, and that's our Torquebox project. So Rails on JBoss, very interesting technology there, and the Play Framework. So those latter three are the ones I'll personally spend more time on. Um, the one, some of the tricky parts with like Wicked or Tapestry or Stripes, being that they're a little more esoteric, not as well known, uh, you'll have some challenges with finding developers for them. So if you want to grow your team, let's say you're hiring 25 people today to start a new project, it might be hard to find 25 Wicked programmers in your geographic territory. You might have to hire them from around the globe, as an example. So you want to factor that into your decision-making process. And Matt's little uh, matrix there does a nice job of thinking through some of those criteria. And he has a weighted version of it spreadsheet, so you can actually go in there and say, look, this is more important to me than other things. Productivity is more important than can I find developers or number of books available or more important to me than other things, that kind of thing. So servlets and JSPs and EJB. These guys are standardized in the 1990s, uh, so late 1990s, obviously. Um, but it was a response and to or a reaction to proprietary CGI like get post handlers. So I worked with a couple of them. Um, so Silverstream was one I worked with way back when. NetDynamics is one I was also familiar with. Um, and these guys kind of grew out of the you know client server era and did it on the web with Java. It was kind of the idea. So I didn't have to use Perl anymore. I didn't have to use um, uh, other technologies like Cold Fusion anymore or even ASP, uh, you know, Active Server Pages from Microsoft anymore. I could basically start using Java, right, to build these dynamic web pages. And so servlets and JSPs were a standardization of that. Would I suggest using this today? Well, it's a basis for your technology. No one really wants to write a bunch of servlets if they don't have to, or, um, and they'd rather not sling a bunch of JSP code if they don't have to. We've kind of evolved beyond this, and we have higher level frameworks to sit on top of them. So I threw this in as old school JSP scriptlets. I actually got an email from the first session that basically said, hey, I remember doing that kind of stuff. And I know some of you guys are, you know, your gag reflex is kicking in there on, on the on the webinar presentation. You're saying, wow, look at that. There's um, a class dot four name loading a JWC driver in that scriptlet. Yeah, that's good code there. Um, I'll admit it. I had written this code myself. I went digging it out of an archive from about 1997, I think it was, uh, a long time ago. And it was a just to hack a quick and dirty thing that I had to do to make something happen. But you can see what a scriptlet looks like, and we know that's a bad practice in today's market. But some of you have probably encountered this kind of code before, as I have. So Strut Spring and Hibernate kind of really blew up in 2006 or so. I got really popular. Model View Controller, we, got, we really geeked out on that and talked about it as industry, and everybody started adopting that mindset, so we didn't have all that embedded Java logic inside our scriptlets anymore. We learned how to use Spring and Hibernate along that same time frame and got really popular. Uh, it's still a common way for people to extend existing applications. If you walk around in, in various markets around the, 
around the world and say, hey, what are you doing with Java code? They might still be, right, on an old version of WebSphere, an old version of WebLogic, still running an old Struts application that they're still required to maintain. Some of you on the phone today may still have that. Uh, the Struts Spring Hibernate stack, though, is primarily supplanted by Spring NBC Spring and Hibernate. So I kind of put this in the maintenance category. People still maintaining applications, extending existing applications, but very few new projects on the Strut Spring Hibernate stack. So I threw this diagram in here. This is from a presentation I did back in 2002. Uh, so approximately um, nine years ago now. Um, but so the action servlet there in the middle, you can see our post to a save simple dot do, right? And we had the Struts Config XML. Um, I threw this in there only for nostalgia's sake. It kind of reminded me of something I had done a long time ago. Um, but in the same in the same era of 2006 or so, you know, the rise of POJOs came about. We kind of had this backlash against EJBs. We said, look, I don't want to build um, a component with four interfaces and two XML files, and and had seven files now to manage within my within my application. And uh, I used to teach EJB, and it was really hard to convince people what an EJB activate did and EJB passivate did, especially since they were a little bit different on every container. So trying to explain those concepts was um, was difficult. So POJOs have won out, uh, and so that's why EJB3 is POJO based, and, and Spring really kind of taught us that from a from an industry standpoint, open source standpoint. So Spring MVC, Spring, and Hibernate is kind of now a, the new stack, if you will, that seems to be very popular. Struts1 was replaced by Struts2, which was previously known as WebWork. So as WebWork it was an exciting little project, and they rebranded um, re themselves as Struts2, but they were not compatible. So that left the door open, right? So when you have one technology move from one to two and it's not compatible, you can't move skills, you can't move code over, that means there was another opportunity, a, an open window, if you will, and Spring MVC slid right in there. And if you look at Spring MVC 3, uh, the declarative controllers that they have is really nice, and I'll show you an example of that in a second. Um, so we're finding, or I'm finding, that there's a lot of Spring MVC usage out there right now. So Spring MVC, Spring and Hibernate is a very common way for people to build their current web applications. Um, and a lot of people are still starting applications even in this stack, okay? Even for a rich internet application. So just a little screenshot here and a little bit of code. This is an example of a controller. We'll dig into that more in a second. Um, and it's pretty straightforward. There's no XML required. You basically lay down your controllers, they're all done declaratively, and those, of course, back up certain URLs of your application. You can see that the URL is mapped to certain methods within this, within this application. Okay, so let's just actually just show you the code. That would probably be the easiest thing. So I got my desktop shared here, and here's my to-do controller. You can see at controller here. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, was pretty obvious back in the spring day you know spring required you to create this application context xml and you had to do a ton of xml coding so to speak in addition to the java coding well the the spring world has certainly adopted the annotations in a big way over the last couple of years and you can see if i look at my uh, xml file i'm looking at this mvc colon annotation driven and that allows you to do the at controller trick right so now i have at controller and now I'm simply binding these methods to certain URLs and certain request um, methods. So I have a get against to do's. Well, didn't mean to select that. I have get from to do's all. I have a post. So if you're doing a post, that's actually going to insert a record, create a to do. And if you're doing a get, it's going to get a to do list. And let me show you what the user interface looks like um, so it makes some more sense. So it just has a list up top here. It's like a little basic CRUD application, a list up here showing you the list of all the records in the database and then of course a, a form here so you can actually add new records to the database and it's just a to-do list you know who owns it a summary description I can delete the record and I can also mark it as completed when it's done um, so it's a pretty simple user interface and everything's can combined in one one look and feel you can see total number of records total number of three to-dos there so you can see how that's handled all right so there's a delete to-do a complete to-do all right, so if you if you click on delete here, and if you look in the lower right hand or lower left hand corner of the screen, you can see um, delete to do 15, complete to do 15. That's what the URL looks like, and that's going to map back to these items here in my controller. And then the JSP is very straightforward, right? It's a, a basic JSP uses JSTL functionality. I did this example to make it really easy, really simple for myself. I want to be able to interact with the database, have a nice little form and user interface. 
Um, you have a total number of to-dos, right? To-do list. And the thing's really nice here. You can see to-do.owner, to-do.summary, to-do.description. All we do is use JSTL to iterate through that list provided by the controller and displays nicely on our screen. Okay? Uh, I can even do the split screen here and you can kind of see what it looks like a little... If you look at our visual page editor here, you can actually see uh, what that form looks like. And I use this to navigate every now and then. Okay, where's that field at inside the source code? And so I'll use that feature from time to time. And um, I'll show you one other application. And that is the spring travel application. You can see here it's loaded up uh, here on JBoss. Let me minimize that. And I can, this is a, the standard demo application they like to use, spring MVC based. I can type in Atlanta, hit the find hotels, get a listing of hotels. That's running on a JBoss application server. And I'm, you can see it running here, my JBoss application server. Ooh, and I lost my window. Where'd it go? All righty. So let's close this guy now. No, no, no. Let's we'll see if we can get it reset. There we go. Um, so you can see here's my JBoss Enterprise Application Platform 5.1 running, and I'm running the travel application out there. And I'm actually running many applications at this time, so I'm running several. And there's the Spring application, Spring Travel application at Spring MVC. I have another Spring MVC uh, example I'll show you in a little bit, but that kind of gives you an idea for how you might build a Spring-based application running on the JBoss platform. Okay, so let's start with the next section here. So Java E5. So Java E5, of course, embraced the concept of POJOs, embraced the concept of annotations, uh, and of course standardized those technologies. And it began to introduce the concept of dependency injection. And it really did a great job of, of refactoring, if you will, the object relational mapping technology around JPA, Java Persistence Architecture. So in Java E5 land, you have JSF1, SIEM2, Rich Faces3, and JPA or Hibernate as your way to build out your application stack. And SIEM2 was in there and was created and injected in there to make JSF1 programming and EJB programming vastly easier. And so you can increase developer productivity. And it's a much more um, cleaner environment to work with. It eliminates a lot of the uh, XML files and cruft and extra DTOs and managed beans and other things you don't really want to work with. It basically allows you to say, here's my user interface component, here's my business logic component, and here's how I access the database and all that other stuff goes away. So Rich Faces 3 brings rich internet application capabilities to an otherwise non-RIA friendly JSF1. So a number of out-of-the-box components that allows you to extend your JSF environment, Java Server Faces environment, with all these really nice tools and capabilities. We'll show you some of those. Okay, and this is today's standards-based development uh, environment. So if you're running on a JBoss platform, this is a standards-based Java E5 platform, then you can run this kind of application. Of course, our JLS portal platform as well. And of course, WebLogic and WebSphere and other implementations of the Java EU specification. So what's going on with Rich Faces? Rich Faces uh, has about 100 out-of-the-box Ajax-enabled JSF components. It's a JSF library of components, much like Ice Faces or Prime Faces. And you can take these and put them into your application fairly easy. I'll show you some examples of that. And of course, you have skinnability. Skinnability sounds like a pretty odd word, I know. What that means is you have this concept of themes. You can say, look, make things red, make things green, make everything kind of, you know, change the style sheet universally throughout my application. There are two um, major libraries associated with Rich Faces, A4J, which is kind of like page level Ajax support. You can actually use and have an existing JSF component you're adding Ajax capability to. And Rich, uh, which is the component level Ajax support, specifically out of the box components, and we'll show you some of those. So a little bit about A4J here. There's uh, some interesting ones to me. Command button and link obviously are widely used and very popular. Everybody has buttons and links in their application. And they want to do Ajax submits, not whole page refreshes. You can use those two buttons. You can also use Ajax support. I'll show you an example of that in a second, where you can actually just take an existing uh, component from JSF and Ajax enable it, which is really nice. And then the push concept I also am pretty interested in. So that's server side push to the client. So you can make that web-based application feel a lot more like a desktop application by having real-time push to the client. Some examples of Rich Faces components that are out there. You can see the calendar object. Uh, you can see there's some drag and drop support, menu objects, data grids, um, all sorts of interesting things. And we'll show you some more examples of that. Tree controls. Okay. A little bit of screen, or a little bit of code here on the screen to kind of indicate 
there's no managed bean anymore. You take your JSF page and you bind it directly to your POJOs, your annotated POJOs. And, and this concept uh, with dependency injection and the capability you have here has been promoted to Java EE6. And, and so it's no longer just a scene thing. It's now part of Java EE6 specification. Uh, and so a lot of the, uh, the benefits and savings and productivity enhancements that have been made by the scene team have driven uh, that back up into the standards. All right, so let's show you some of these demonstrations. Uh, so very much like the spring travel application, the scene team had built the booking application. So let me see if I can log here to the booking application. It's very similar. It's a hotel search kind of thing, hotel booking. And my session is expired, so let me log in there. Okay. And same kind of idea, so type in Atlanta. And you can see as I start typing, it automatically searches for me. All right, so just on the keystrokes themselves, don't have to click the button. That's an example of an AJAX-enabled component. We'll show you the code behind that in a second. Uh, but you can see it makes it more productive for a user to get started just by simply typing. All right, and you can also see this little spinner icon on the right-hand side here, a find hotels if you pay close enough attention to that. Hopefully that comes through the WebEx and might not update fast enough for you to see that. Uh, but that's the booking application. You can download the booking application directly through JBoss Tools um, and deploy it by help project examples. So I didn't mention that in my previous session, but help project examples allows you to grab a hold of a lot of these uh, applications for you. Oh, did I click the right one? In the uh, project examples? Yep, I think so. I got to click the right menu option here. <clears throat> and you can kind of see what the different options are. Okay. Well, at this point, I'm not doing something right, so we'll leave that alone. The, um, but the, the booking application is here. Uh, also, I'll show you the photo album application. This is really nice. It kind of shows off a lot of really advanced, media-rich content. Uh, here you have your tree control on the left-hand side for navigation. I can drill down. I'm looking at all these images. I have a little slider right here so I can expand what I'm seeing. I can start a slideshow and watch it just, you know, this is a modal dialog now, all within the browser, and I'm, you know, pushing through different, you know, images here on a timing basis. So these are, you know, this is all rich faces in action here. You can kind of, here's another little scroll bar here for moving back and forth. All right, so a nice example of rich faces capability. And let's walk you through some of the code here. So the, the type ahead control that you saw out there in the hotel search that's this I, I uh, it's out here in booking 22 okay the booking 22 application and we're going to drill down here to search hotels you can see search criteria and there's a search string here and the thing that makes the magic happen is this a this is a for J here support all right we talked about that in the slides on key up fire this event right hotel search find and the real magic is the re-render property here, re-render search results. And um, all of this is available here in the property sheet for this component. You can also drag and drop from the palette over here, various rich faces or Ajax for JSF components. So you can see there's the um, a listing over here. So you might uh, want to list that there. Okay, I didn't mean to add anything new, but if you click it, it just adds it right in. And then if you look at the re-render search results, there's another search results output panel right here. So basically every time a key up happens, which is the user has typed it and then released the key, uh, then we're going to actually fire that find event and it's going to basically update this IP, uh, output panel in the search results area. So that whole section under search results gets replaced. So if we go back over here, so what we're talking about is this area here, this, this name, address, city, state, zip. So as I type, right, it updates it. Now, that's obviously a lot of traffic back and forth to your server. I wouldn't recommend necessarily pounding your server with that kind of, um, well, it depends on how many users you have. If you're a public.com, you might have to decide how well you deal with that data. This is actually doing a round trip all the way back to the database. Everything's local here on my desktop. It's a Postgres database. Um, but if I was doing that across the internet or for a high scale situation, you'd have to cache some of the data. But uh, Rich Faces also has some tools for that. Uh, and, and the easiest way to show you actually is to show you this other Rich Faces sample application. So this is nice. It's an application I downloaded and deployed to my local server again. It's called Rich Faces Live Demo. 
you can kind of see its name here. And what it does is it, it actually shows you examples of all the Rich Faces components and AJAX for JSF components, one of which is a queue. So you can actually queue events going back to the server, right? So if you might actually wait for the user to finish typing. Let's say they type really, really fast, ATL. You can wait until the L falls before looking at uh, sending all those events to the server. And then, but if they type really, really slowly, A and pause for a while, T and then pause for a while, you can then interact with the user in that way. So for a really fast keystroker, you might want to slow things down and not actually fire all those events at your server. Uh, that's one way to handle it. But you can have queues, named queues, and this is like a little messaging component. You can see it just queues them up and then processes them in the right order. All right, depending on how long each re uh, request or each re how long each request is met by its response. And so what it's doing here is it's actually sending the response on the server has a random wait time. You can kind of see that we can queue things up and then they'll get processed in the correct order. So that's actually very nice. There's also a push mechanism over here. So you can actually tie your user interface maybe to a message-driven bean or a message bean, a JMS queue on the server side, and then have the push come from the server back to the client. All right, which is kind of neat. I could just have messages flowing in here. Um, I like that feature a lot. I also like the bean validator that you see here in Rich Faces. Uh, so if you watch here, I can type, you know, just some bogus stuff. Okay, some some bad information. Uh, and let's see, my age is must be between these numbers. Kind of funny error message, and of course you can override that. So I'll say my age is 55, and my email address is not well formed. So burr sutter at gmail, let's say, and now it's going to be happier. Got those two fixed. Um, and my name must be three characters at least. And the, the nice thing about that is you can do all your validations directly inside the browser. One of the things that we're working on for Rich Races 4 is the ability to actually have those as annotations on your JPA entities. And, and you guys have probably seen Hibernate Validator. Well, we now have Bean Validation in Java v 6 uh, Our team sponsored that particular JSR and put that through the system. So now in EE6, you have Bean Validator. And those declarative annotations will, you know, in Rich Faces 4, actually render the JavaScript for you automatically on the client side. And so all this will happen at the client. You won't have to worry about form submits. So the data will come through clean in that case. The data uh, iteration section has some neat ones in here, like the data grid. Everybody has the need to display a list of data in almost every application I've encountered. You know, a list of data is important, some way to search, an online inquiry kind of thing. And paging that data is always painful to write, hand code on your own. You know, show me the next 10 and previous 10 and next 10 kind of idea. But you can see the list of data here does not have to be like a spreadsheet. It doesn't have to be purely rows and columns. You can actually make it little blocks like this. Uh, and there's numerous capabilities here in Rich Faces for doing things like a data grid or a data table. And you get these things for free out of the box. All you got to do is take advantage of them and use them. And if I go back to my um, search application over here, you can see there's actually a data table embedded in here. And it's working off the, ro the hotels. So the hotels returned by the business logic component is then a, like a for each statement. So this is very similar to the for each statement you saw earlier in the uh, Spring ABC application that I had. Um, in this case, the data table pops it all in nicely for us. Okay. So in addition to data tables, uh, there's great, you know, there's 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 menus. People sometimes like the menus. Um, I don't know if this is the kind of menu I would want in my application. It looks very Windows-like, uh, but some people might want that not normal in a web application, but it might be for what you need, okay? And then we also have tree controls, very popular as well. You can see I drill down on my tree control here and I can drill into it. And you can make that all client side. So if you watch here, there's no flash of the page. Well, this actually this one actually does a reload of the page. It goes a ser it's a server side, right? So you can actually watch my scroll bar and as I as I click, you know, things happen. Um, or server side switch. Maybe this is the better way to say it. Yeah, here's the here's the better way to demonstrate it. So as I switch, you can see it actually does a refresh of the whole page. But tree controls, client side switching, server side switching is nice. Uh, tab panels are also fairly popular uh, out there for our user base. People enjoying the use of tab controls in their application in their browser-based application. 
Uh, you can see here first, second, third. This also has the concept of server side switching versus client side switching. And again, I can change the the skin associated with these. Maybe I one nice color here, nice pinkish color. Um, I have the I have uh, a calendar control. All right, again, very popular. You know, everybody likes putting these kinds of things in their application these days, and let the user pick from a calendar. Roll forward a couple months. Okay, um, we have combo boxes. If you guys are familiar with the Visual Basic and Power Builder era, we had combo boxes back in the days, you know, 15 years ago. Well, now we have them again in the world of the web. So you thought combo boxes were lost forever, maybe. You know, and there's our suggestions, but I can type in something else, or I can pick from my list. Okay, so combo box is simply a text field combined with a drop-down list box, but that's a foreign concept to a lot of web applications, so I like, I like pointing that one out also. There's also a, um, a rich editor here, so a little, you know, what you see is what you get. You know, I can type it in, hit bold italics, a little editor for my users. And um, I also like this one here, the list shuttle. I point this one out because I've had to build this particular user interface construct numerous times in numerous technologies over the last couple decades. So funny enough, this concept of selecting stuff from the list on the left, putting it on the list on the right, then allowing up and down and move things around, that little idea I've had to do in numerous technologies for the web, for client server, for various programming languages. So it's nice to have one of those out of the box here. And one more I'll show you because um, it's pretty interesting to me. One of the big knocks on web development overall is this concept of hotkey handling or, can, you know, the reason Visual Basic or .NET and web or WinForm should still be used, you know, what some people would say, is that, well, my users are heads down data entry people. They don't want to be playing with that mouse. They want to just pound in the data and keep moving. Uh, well, in this case, you know, you can actually map certain hotkeys. You can see control left, control right allows me to navigate these images. And I'm just using the keys on the keyboard, no mouse whatsoever. So I like that feature too. So I'll just point those things out to you to give you a little feel for what Rich Faces is doing um, and, and so how some JSF and Steam-based applications are built. But this is certainly an option for you, much like we showed you the, the Spring technology as well and, and very popular amongst our user base. Let's hop back into the presentations and talk a little bit about GWT, all right? Google Web Toolkit. Very popular in the last couple years. Uh, it has really kind of blossomed and boomed onto the scene in a big way. Uh, like Flex, it eliminates deep learning of client-side technologies. So uh, both Flex and GWT have the same property of I don't need to learn HTML necessarily. I don't have to learn JavaScript. I don't have to learn style sheets. And I know for some people, that's a big win. They don't want to have to learn the web stuff if they don't want to. Um, so they'll ignore the JavaScript style sheets. They'll use GWT or Flex, and it'll render the entire client for you from server-side technology. One thing to understand about GWT is it's a compiler. It's a compiler that will take your Java code and convert it into JavaScript code. And I notice I say auto-magically. Um, so it's, it is kind of auto-magic when you look at it, seeing it happen. Uh, I'll show you a quick demo of that so you kind of see the magic happen. Uh, and then uh, there's some great widget libraries for GWT out there. And this is one of the reasons it's really starting to do well, I think, is Smart, uh, Smart Google Web Toolkit, uh, GWT Mosaic, and the Incubator Project have the URLs listed there. Some great widget libraries are now available for GWT-based developers, and you can have, like the Rich Faces library, right? You can have now libraries of components for your GWT development. So this technology is really doing well. Um, I would say the selection criteria are when you have teams with little native web UI, right? And you don't really want to worry about HTML, style sheets, and cascading uh, JavaScript. So you can you build your app this way, uh, much like you would with Flex. Uh, one reason you don't choose Flex, though, is because you're too much worried about vendor lock-in, and you feel that, in this case, the Google technology will be a little more open for you. Um, that's a call your team will have to make. But if you want to make a great web UI, GWT is a, certainly a solution for you. We actually are building several of our internal technologies using GWT. The JBoss BRMS here um, is, is a GWT-based application. The new JBPM console is a GWT-based application. Uh, so there's some rather large applications we're building on Google Web Toolkit for running on a JBoss platform. So let me show you a little demo of that. The first thing I'll show you is the, the BRMS. I have it running here on my local server. And the business rule management system from the Drools project. Again, I have, you know, a nice little scrollable menu over here, like you might see Microsoft Outlook or something of that nature, very desktop-like application. 
I can drill down into the tree control to navigate to my, my data, a nice list here of data. I can even sort it, you know, sort descending. I can double click on something, right? And that pops open yet another tab. So I have the tabs here. And then I can uh, have modal dialog boxes. So a very rich, you know, user interface from a user standpoint, very, very nicely done. You can interact with it in a great way. Uh, and this is, of course, a product and technology that we sell, but we built it with us using Google Web Toolkit. And so obviously it runs great uh, on JBoss Solutions. So I'd highly recommend you check that one out. Uh, I'll just show you one of my favorite features of the BRMS. It has built-in testing, which is really kind of exciting. Um, but it also, from user interface standpoint, notice how it, it blocks me out. It goes modal for a second while it's running its job, and then it releases the user interface. So now I can interact with it again. But it uses these nice bars to tell me what tests succeeded, which ones may have be a concern. So I'd encourage you to check that one out. It comes from a drills project, and the product is otherwise known as the JBoss BRMS. Again, a wet based technology. But let's show you from a design time tooling standpoint what we've been doing. One of the things that's tricky about using the Google plugins in Eclipse, whenever you use the Google plugins, they want to build a project that's unique to Google. It only deploys to Google, it only runs on Google. And here I'll just show you that. So this is my Google project. And we'll put in a package name. All right. And I'm going to just say I want the Google Web Toolkit. I just want to use those tools, those plugins. I hit finish. Okay. And I need to add it to my active working set here. I've got so many projects I close certain things down. So my Google project, there it is. Finish. And we'll look here. And so where is my Google project? Oh, there it is. Um, so if you look here, all right, and then go back to my servers, normally if you're dealing with a project in uh, Web Tool, uh, WTP, so Web Tool um, web tool Project, you can actually drag and drop that to your server. So if this is a Web Server, Web Logic Server, JBoss Server, Tomcat Server, whatever it is, right, you normally just drag and drop, or you can say Add Remove. So right click, Add Remove. You notice my Google Project's not even listed here, all right? And I can't drag and drop it. See, it just gives me the little circle there, the uh, no Ghostbusters symbol. And so I can't even drag and drop it. And so I, you can't deploy the Google project. So the Google plugin has some issues with that. It really wants you to work on their server is kind of the idea, debugging and testing on their server. And, of course, deployment to Google App Engine, which I've done some of those things too. Um, but what we've done is we have a nice little workaround. And this is JBoss Tools. I just set up this Eclipse environment. Uh, less than a month ago from jboss.org and jboss tools has a little feature to work around this problem so let me show you how that what that workaround looks like I can say file new and other and I'll say I want a dynamic web project this is the standard web project format used for any WTP or Eclipse based you know, Java EU project and I'm going to call this my jboss wit project um, and, and we'll call it January 12th right just to give it a unique name make sure it's unique Everything else looks all fine here. I want to use my JBoss platform 5.1 runtime. Uh, and now I'm going to click modify here. All right. And notice this uh, project facet called Google Web Toolkit Experimental. So this is where we're kind of tricking the Google Web Toolkit plugin to work properly from, a, from working with other servers. So if I click that, I can now deploy this thing to a JBoss solution. So let me hit next, or JBoss server. And I'm going to say OK here. And I want to generate sample code. This gives me a little Google Web Toolkit Hello World, the standard Hello World you get with the Google Web Toolkit plugin. That way you can actually see WIT running right out of the box. So I'm going to hit Finish here. And it's going to build a project for me. And it takes a few seconds. And let me add it to my working set so we can see it. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Here we go. So here's my project. And so here it is, okay, over here on the right-hand side. And what I want to do now is I want to do, uh, I can, well, first thing I need to do is do a compile on it. So let me right-click, and let me show you this little tab here. So watch this part portion of my screen. Um, when I said earlier that GWT operates like a compiler, and it takes your Java code and renders JavaScript, let me run the compile. And so where's my Google menu item? Way down here at the bottom. All right, Google, quit, compile. All right, uh, I don't need to worry about saving that thing I was working on earlier. So yes, compile that project, compile. 
and you'll it takes a few seconds but you can watch it go through its its process here you can see it's compiling this and it's uh, going through the process and you'll also see it just drop in the JavaScript it's generating for me right in here but this allows you to work in a GWT environment with the GWT tools inside of Eclipse but also make that project a JBoss project or in this case a WTB project so it's deployable to other app servers uh, by default the applications uh, only deploy to its embedded Jetty environment that's what the Google plugin does so it works great if you're deploying to Google App Engine and nowhere else but in my case I want to deploy to my local servers like in this case JBoss you can see it's going through its six permutations. I'm not really sure what the six mean. I should have researched that. My guess is it's different permutations of browser versions and browser combinations. But you can see there it drops in all those additional files for me. And now if I click on Add Remove, I can see that my application shows up here on my list. And I can add it to my live running JBoss server and hit Finish. It goes through the publication process, syncs it up on my server, loads it out there. And I'm going to copy that. And just go to my browser here and type in localhost 8080 and put in the project name, put in my name, and hit send. Let's see if this blows up. Nope, works great. So this is just hello world that you get out of the box. You can then go in there and mess with the Java code and redeploy it if that's what you want to do. But it's a it's a nice everyday application that you can interact with. And um, this is now a GWT based application and runs on JBoss. So I just want to point that tool out to you. Um, it's available as a plugin out there at JBoss Tools, and uh, so if you're if you're from, you can see what I have loaded here. I got JBoss Tools loaded, the Scene Tools, Subversion, I got Spring ID Tools, Hibernate Tools, um, uh, but the JBoss Tools includes that Google component. I don't know where it, where it's listed, but if you go out there and use the Google, um, JBoss Tools update site, you'll see it in the list. You can just drop it right in. Okay, so I encourage you to check that one out if you're interested in Quit. I personally, you know, showed it here today and tried it as well, and it's pretty interesting. I like that technology. So that's the way to get around the GWT problems. Okay, jQuery and ExtJS plus REST. So I've actually spent some time looking at this particular architecture. I, I personally like this one. This one's very fun. This is where you want to build your whole UI tier in JavaScript. Basically, say I'm building a client-server application where the client's all JavaScript and cascading style sheets and HTML, and the server side is all Java with a RESTful endpoint. And I'm going to host that on my Java-based application server. And what goes between the client and the server is JSON, JavaScript object notation. And this is, you would choose this solution, this architecture, when you want to be in full control of that web experience for your end user. And you really want to tweak out that user interface on a device-by-device -device perspective, or maybe I want to do something very exotic for Firefox or Chrome or Safari, um, or you know my Android-based browser or my iPad browser, which might be different experience than my iPhone browser. Yes, it's the same technology, but because I have more real estate, maybe I want to drive that UI a little bit differently. So that idea of really having touch control, um, you know, you know, when the user drags the finger across the screen, I want to react to that differently than if they're clicking a button kind of thing with their, with their finger. Um, so this is the HTML5 way of thinking of development, and you can use various JavaScript libraries and stuff like that out there for you. Uh, some people are really focused on this kind of development. They think it's the way to go for all type of web development. JavaScript clients using JSON to a, a server-side architecture. Uh, the server-side architecture could be Spring MVC. I have a demo of what I've done there. Uh, REST Easy, which is a technology we provide from the JBoss platform standpoint based on JAX-RS. Uh, the Play framework has got some popularity here too, so that's why it's on my radar and I've been monitoring it. And the Ruby on Rails world certainly would suggest that RESTful architecture would have but a nice web client is a good thing too. Um, so again, Spring MVC has this nice declarative controller concept, and you can actually map URLs in that declarative controller and, and interact with them directly from JavaScript. So in this case, uh, this get, get JSON, J, this is jQuery here, uh, news ticker slash get data goes and grabs news items off the server. And then if you look at my produce list here, I'm going to iterate through the list of news items coming from the database, coming from the server, but it looks like JavaScript to me. All right? If I'm the JavaScript programmer, I'm interacting with those items as if they're Java objects or JavaScript objects. I don't care. right? It, it, it works the same both ways. It's really nice. Uh, nice environment. And what Spring MVC has done is, let me see if I can find that example here. Okay. You know, so here's, the, there, this is my application. It's all JavaScript, right? <laughs> there's a rich editor. There's a a timer thing that I have, and I've just been playing playing with this thing.
But if you look here, produce the list, you know, my value.image, here's my value, right? And my value.body, the image and the body, those attributes come directly off the JPA entity, right, on the server side. So let's look at that. Uh, do I have it open here? Not my to-do item. Okay, minimize that. Go to the right project. So like the news.jsp there. And if I look at my controllers for this guy, all right, my news controller. Okay, so if a git is issued, or the git data is issued, all right, it's going to return all the items that it finds in this news item service. If I look at the news item service here, it's a standard JPA kind of thing. Uh, remove news items, find news items. So here we go. So it's going to issue the JPA query. It's going to select from news item the database. Uh, news item, of course, is just a regular old domain, plain old Java object, domain object, nothing fancy there with the appropriate annotations at entity. And it has an ID, right? Getters and setters, standard POJO kind of development. And then the service basically says, okay, here's what we do when you say find news items. It returns a list of news items, all right? And if I look at my controller, it returns that list of news items directly out to the browser, all right? So the interesting thing about this is uh, Spring MVC knows to serialize that as JSON for me. I don't have to think about it. I don't have to do it. It happens automatically, and it goes out to the browser. And, of course, my, my client, in this case, my JavaScript client here, just simply iterates through it. Um, so we'll, let's just run that real quick and show it for you. I didn't actually get a chance to finish my port of this one. It still runs on Google App Engine. Um, uh, so, but let me do it this way. We'll do a run as web application. We'll run it through the Google, the Google plugin specifically. Um, for it's my Google App Engine application, and I actually have a version out there running on Google App Engine. But it's just something I've been playing with. So let's do this. All right. And so. I have something to say that is news worthy. All right, and then I might want to make this a different color. I can, you know, so this is an example of a jQuery editor that I found. It's really nice. You can give your users a, a you know, a rich text editor here to do all kinds of crazy stuff if they want, embed links. And then they're going to hit send. And again, that's, that's going to be an Ajax post back to the server. And then it's going to then refresh and show me what other people have been saying. This is kind of like a little news chat thing, right? If you bring up multiple users, you'll see that they all get different avatars. Um, and they can, you can all see what everybody else is saying. And then I have another version where it's just a polar. So if you want to be a read-only user, you can kind of watch it. Just watch it pull through and get the records off the database. But all that's interacting with RESTful services from a, a pure JavaScript client. All right, so it's a neat way to build applications. And of course, I can fine tune this any way I want for any kind of browser, any kind of iPhone, or whatever I need, because I have full control of the client in this case. From an HTML and cascading style sheet standpoint, JavaScript standpoint. It does mean you got to learn JavaScript, though. That might be a disadvantage um, for you. All right, so that's what that little application looks like. All right, from a Flex standpoint, and we're about winding down here. Uh, so Adobe Flex, again, a server-side development environment. You, you build MXML. Um, and it generates for you a Flash user interface. So like GWT will compile and generate a JavaScript user interface for you. Flex will generate a Flash user interface for you. So incredibly rich support for scrollable, editable data grids, uh, as well as charts and graphs. So the people I found who really love Flex, they, they use the charting and the business graphs, and they use the editable data grids a lot, like spreadsheet entry kind of data entry. Uh, or they might use a lot of media-rich content, streaming video, streaming audio, that kind of thing. Um, but I've known some projects, really big projects, working on Flex. Uh, and some things to watch out for are like Flex Builder is, is not a pure development environment from a, uh, if, you're, if you're a Java developer, let's say, it, it kind of gets a little clunky. It can be slow and heavy. It can trigger a build sometimes randomly. You'll be in there editing a file, you hit save, and next thing you know, you're building the entire application. And that could take several minutes. So I've had some teams of developers I've talked to, they, they specifically said, you know, the Flex Builder can really be painful at times. It's a little bit harder to get the build to run when you want it to run. Uh, and third-party control libraries really haven't blossomed in this industry. So there's not necessarily a smart, uh, you know, like in the GWT, Google Web Toolkit, GWT world, you have Smart GWT and EXT uh, and, and Mosaic. And in the JSF world, you have Rich Faces like we showed you, or Ice Faces or Prime Faces. You don't have as much of that investment by third parties in building control libraries for Flex uh, as some of the feedback that I've had from different users. 
But again, if you're building a media-rich, hardcore, desktop-like application, a fat client-like application, it might be the way you want to go. And I don't have a demo of it running. I didn't have a chance to get it all, all that working today. But there's a URL here, and again, I can send you this presentation to YouTube where uh, James Ward, uh, a fantastic fellow who does great presentations around Adobe Flex, I encourage you to watch his little video here. He does great stuff. Um, does a really nice demonstration of how to make an Adobe Flex application running for a desktop, a browser-based, and an Android-based, uh, Flex-based application, which is very nice. So Java E6 uh, is the next generation beyond Java E5. So if you're interested in standards-based development, and again, ratcheting up that productivity and ease of use for a developer, we've migrated from the JSF1 and Scene 2 and Rich Faces 3 world to JSF2, Scene 3, and Rich Faces 4 world. So JSF2 is a leap ahead for productivity and ease of use and ease of development. And Scene 3, and Scene basically has been the standardization drive for JBoss to drive standardization through the uh, JCP. And now you'll see a ton of that in, um, and notice here I have a typo, JSF 299, should be JSR 299. Uh, so CDI is one of the JSRs that came out of that. Uh, we've also had updates to JSF, Beam Validation, and there's a few others. So it's a standardization of what we saw in the Scene project, and now we have it out there as far as Java E6 goes. Um, if you're interested in standards-based development and you want to be on a standards-based portable platform, then you need to look for the JBoss Enterprise Portable Platform 6 or Enterprise um, Regular Platform 6 and WebLogic, WebSphere, everybody and the major app server renders is adopting that. If you want to drill down on this technology, though, we have another webinar next week. Uh, so if you go to jboss.org slash webinars, and we'll be focusing on that particular technology. So quick summary. Obviously, if you're dealing with plain old serverless and plain old JSP, and EJB2, hopefully that's a legacy environment for you. You don't have to touch it that often. Some of you may still be maintaining a strut spring hibernate architecture that you adopted a few years ago. Uh, today's new development, people starting projects today, at least in 2010, a lot of Spring NBC, Spring and JPA we see out there. Um, a lot of people adopted JSF1, Scene 2, Rich Faces 3, and I showed you some demos of what that looked like when it came to the, those kind of applications. Um, we do see a lot of activity around GWT right now, Google Web Toolkit. And I call that for the non-JavaScript savvy crowd. I don't want to deal with JavaScript or the client. I want to let GWT deal with that for me. Um, for the people who are hardcore about the client, though, want to be all about JavaScript, there's a huge push right now in the jQuery or ExtJS world and RESTful inter interaction on the server side. So it's kind of funny. You have your GWT people who don't want to see it and your, you know, your jQuery people who want to live it. It's kind of interesting. But you got both audiences out there. If you're really building a rich internet application that's really desktop-like, like you would have in the Visual Basic days or Power Builder days, then Flex is something you should look at. And then uh, for tomorrow's web-based applications, right, JSF2, CDI, Rich Faces 4, that's your EE6 environment and standards-based development. So just be on, that's on the horizon. Just be aware of that. So the last slide, I'll throw that up here and um, put things in context. My purpose today was to show you different web application frameworks, talk about the ins and outs, and basically say that these things run well on the JBoss platform. You want to be able to take advantage of these back-end services that the JBoss platform provides, like uh, persistence, right, JPA, uh, transactions, JTA, messaging, JMS, background jobs, uh, so, you know, the ability to queue jobs, run things asynchronously, distributed caching, a highly scalable data grid or cache environment, clustering, as, you know, saving state across multiple servers, one dies, the other guy takes over, that's good, security, declarative security, uh, back-end spring services, back-end EJB services, so all those different tools, all those different uh, services are available to you in the container, inside the server, and then you just layer on your appropriate view layer or combine different pieces of a view layer in your various applications. And today I was running a lot of these off the same server, so you can run them all simultaneously.